Good afternoon, everyone. And I want to thank you all so much for joining our webinar this afternoon. And we're very excited to have you all here. And I hope you all are staying healthy and safe. And uh, we're very excited we about the webinars that we've been doing, our series that's been set up. So hopefully you can check out some other ones as well. Um, I do want to mention that in order to get credit for the CPE that you will need to um, stay on the, the program until it concludes. Um, we have this scheduled for one hour and we are very excited to have our presenter this afternoon, um, Paul Weiss. He's going to be doing our program on developing and maintaining ethical standards in your career. We do have a chat section on the um, webinar, so if you do have any questions or anything, you are able to put those in there. We will try to leave a little bit of time at the end of the program so that we can answer some of those questions. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Paul. Um, Paul serves as the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships for Surgent Professional Education, an innovative technology solutions provider for the accounting and, and finance profession. And Surgeon is actually also a partner of AFWA, so we're very pleased to have Paul joining us this afternoon. Um, in this role, Paul oversees all strategic account relationships globally. He has previously served as Director of Business Development for Rogers CPA Review and in a regional management role with Becker Professional Education. Paul also serves on the International Board of Directors with Beta Alpha Psi the International Honors Organization for Accounting, Finance, Business Analytics, and Digital Technology students and professionals. He also assists as a consultant and guest lecturer on a variety of accounting advisory professional development panels and universities. So we are very pleased to have Paul joining us this afternoon. Um, so Paul, I'm going to turn the program over to you and thank you very much for joining us. Ab absolutely. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to be here and appreciate you all joining me from whatever, uh, where, wherever and whatever location uh, you may be. And I actually am in my home office. Uh, I'm north of Philadelphia by about an hour. And uh, I've, uh, I tend to work remotely a good portion of the time. Uh, so this hasn't been as much of a switch for me as it has been, I know, for many, many people. Um, but wherever you are, again, welcome. And, and I just want to say again, thanks to Cindy, thanks to um, AFWA, and, and a genuine, look, I know every day I get an email from somebody, a company or a business or something, you know, saying we're doing our part and we hope everyone's okay. And I think at this point, sometimes it gets a little bit like we're just used to seeing them. So I just, for a moment, just genuinely want to make sure that we express, you know, our thanks for being here. We hope you all are doing well. We hope you all are staying safe um, and definitely hope that, um, you know, you're going to get something out of this next uh, 50 to 55 minutes that we're going to spend, that we're going to spend together. So uh, just a little bit of house cleaning and then uh, is, part of an, is part of our introduction too. So normally um, this is an interactive webinar that is given, or excuse me, a workshop that's given in person. And we've obviously adjusted this to a virtual format. Um, and so through this adaptation, it's kind of a work in progress. This is the fourth time I've given it virtually um, in the last month and each time it's gone pretty well. So um, as we go through this, Cindy mentioned that there was gonna be, there is a chat function and a Q&A function. If possible, if you could submit your questions through the Q&A function, just so we only have one um, area to look at, that would be great. And then I will be pausing um, throughout and then Cindy and I will take a look and see if there's any questions or comments um, that you all would like to make and then obviously we'll have time at the end for your um, for your commentary as well. Now this is a workshop that was developed um, originally for students or for people just entering the workforce. So as you can imagine from uh, from our point of view on the exam review side and also on the CPE side um, we work with a lot of people who are either students or just entering the workforce. And so this is sort of how this, how this um, uh, workshop came to be. So what we've done, though, for seasoned professionals um, who are in organizations such as yourself is we've kind of adapted it in the way that I'm going to connect, conduct it and tell the story, so to speak. So um, there's definitely something for you to get out of it in terms of having that ethical conversation and just keeping ethics and 
I guess in the forefront of our mind is what I want to say, but it's also um, really set up too so that you can take this and there's something valuable behind it. So you can take this and if you have people that are, you know, interns or first or second year people in your organizations, or you just want to, you know, you do something around ethics as an organization and you want to supplement it um, with this, that's another reason why we do this. So at the end of the presentation, uh, this, it's going to be recorded. And then I will also be sending over the slides to Cindy so that she can distribute those to you. And you are, again, free to use those as practitioners, however you would like to, to further the discussion of ethics. Um, you know, the, the main thing is having the conversation. So uh, if any of you, and I, I'm assuming we all have, have attended a traditional sort of ethical workshop or ethics seminar, um, a lot of times those can be pretty boring and pretty dry where you go through, uh, you know, sort of like statements and you go through lists of ethical standards and people come in and say, this is what you should do here and this is what you should do here. Um, the impetus for this presentation was to not be that. So. Uh, this is not about right or wrong answers. This is about just thinking through things and keeping it again top of funnel in the mind um, because surveys show that those who talk about it, who participate in these types of uh, activities, who promote it within their companies, et cetera, people perform better when they really need to perform better, when they really need to make that ethical decision, as, as I'm sure that we all have been uh, faced with. And then again, just, you know, again, keeping it in the, the minds of people who are new or earning the workforce or just our staff in general. So um, that's basically what we're going to do this. And I think, I, let me see, I just, I mentioned the Q&A. Uh, so that, so we, we have that. And then the other thing is, um, if any of you are on here that have seen this presentation before, uh, I know that I was at the, uh, had the pleasure of doing this workshop at the annual meeting about seven months ago, and maybe you're on for the CP or whatever. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully there's still something, uh, that you will, uh, will you get out, of, you will get out of it. And then the, uh, the last thing, and then we'll jump into this is please add your comments to your comments are very helpful. This uh, is a continuous, what I call a continuous work in process. Um, it was originally started by uh, two very good friends of mine, Christine Kiratan, who's a retired partner from Moss Adams, and she lectures at San Francisco State University, and another very good, very good friend of mine who's my colleague now, Ryan Hirsch, and he was formerly with the NASBA Center for the Public Trust. I happened to go back and look at the original iteration of this workshop that we did years ago, and it's completely changed. And I hope um, that it's improved. So again, your comments are really, really important to making this uh, not only good, but continuing to improve it in every, every iteration. So thank you uh, for letting me go through that. And I, I appreciate that very much. So the learning objectives today, and excuse me, I'm going to, I'm going to stop my video just for bandwidth sake here. Um, so learning objectives today, obviously ethics, we're going to try and agree on a definition. Uh, we also want to talk about the non-CPA perception of CPAs, and we're going to broaden that to the financial uh, professional, the perception of those who are not in the finance world and the perception of the finance professional. We want to talk about why it's important to discuss ethical standards, and then we're going to go through a series of case studies and kind of get an idea of how you should or how you would respond uh, when faced with certain ethical dilemmas, and we're going to give some case studies to really I think make people think. And you know, as we go through this, a lot of these case studies we'll get to, they seem pretty obvious on uh, you know, on the surface so to speak, and so you'll look at these and be like, okay, well this this is obvious and that's really what we want. We're trying to get at sort of these ethical situations that seem obvious so that we can have the broader conversation and figure out maybe how they're just not so obvious. So let's start with the definition of ethics. And I think that everybody on can pretty much agree with this. So uh, this comes straight from, I believe this comes from Webster's, but it's, it's pretty much agreed upon, right? It's the discipline dealing with what is good and bad with moral duty and obligation. It's a set of moral principles. It's principles of conduct that govern individuals or groups. Um, groups uh, it's also a guiding philosophy so that's the definition and if you go into any sort of uh, discussion about ethics whether it's a college class whether it's a group of seasoned professionals pretty much anywhere that anybody has sort of any understanding of this 
everybody will pretty much agree on this, right? And so the uh, objective, I guess, is to really take it to the next step and figure out what that means. And that's, again, what this conversation is about. It's not about saying this is what you should do in this situation, but it's more about what would you do and why would you do it? So given the definition, um, you know, how are people's ethical beliefs, uh, you know, created? Where do you get your ethical beliefs, right? So your beliefs are shaped by obviously your environment, uh, repetitious information, credible people, sometimes not credible people, uh, life's experiences, whether you're religious, whether you had a non-religious upbringing, depending upon what part of the world you come from. So all these things shape our ethical standards. Now, what's interesting about this is that, and by the way, I would recommend, um, there's a great book called Ethical Beginnings uh, by Waymond Rogers, and you can find it on uh, Amazon or wherever you, wherever you buy books, and it really goes into how ethical standards are formed in people, and it's quite, it's quite an interesting read. So um, given that though, right, so we, we understand where these come from, but what's interesting about ethics and why it's so fascinating and honestly why I got into sort of doing this workshop is ethics are one of the few things that people think they have a absolute specific code for the most part and it doesn't move. In other words, I have core beliefs that I stand by and that's how I operate in this world and yet ethical sort of beliefs from a global perspective or world world perspective are continually changing, right? They're continually shifting. And so I always propose at this point, I say, so think about not only how your ethical beliefs are and what you believe in, but think about how varying they can be and how many different things you can have, right? Or different beliefs you can have. So we tend to have a general belief uh, or general ethical uh, sort of belief, but then think about some specific areas, right? So I love doing this with college students too, right? Because especially in a college um, college uh, environment, a lot of times, you know, we have this appetite for learning and, and creativity, but we also, this is where a lot of things, times we come to determine what we believe, right? And so think about what your general ethics are, but then also how they change or how they um, how they're altered for specific areas of life, right? So think about our financial world. What are our ethical beliefs or our system as relates to the financial world? What about sports? Um, one of the things we talk about a lot is should college athletes be paid? That's an interesting ethical discussion. Uh, religion, politics, um, taking it back to sports. Uh, if anybody follows football, there has been a tremendous, tremendous discussion over the last 10 to 15 years about concussions and um, what the NFL's role is and how liable they are for some of the um, damage that's been been done to the, the people who play this part. And you'll hear that all the time, right? There's an ethical discussion about it. Well, they know what they're getting into, so it's their fault. No, the NFL, they, they withheld information. A fantastic debate, but it is determined a lot how you view it by your ethical standards, right? Um, tobacco is an interesting one. You know, tobacco, um, I believe in most states, they've raised it now to 21. And people will argue, well, look, if you can serve your country at 18, you probably should be able to drink a beer and have a cigarette if you want. That's a fantastic discussion um, in terms of how people view it and the ethics that they apply to it. Um, legalization of marijuana, that's another one. And I would also argue that just in the last month, um, depending upon where you live, uh, what is a list of essential businesses? Should our local and state governments be telling us what can and can't be open? Um, what is essential? Is alcohol essential? Um, you know, is Walmart getting advantage because they sell groceries so people can buy other things in there? And that varies from state to state. So you can take this ethical, the reason I'm going into such detail about it, it seems obviously, but it, it, I go into the granular because you can take this discussion and really, uh, you know, if you have a staff that you're working with and integrating this into sort of um, just the, the general uh, company culture, you can really have some fun with it because people don't always think about how ethics really, um, it affects every single thing that we do and what we do. And then again, these are just some obviously some other ones too. Um, and I mentioned the medical marijuana one, but suffrage was an interesting one, right? That that was for 
you know, for years, right? For a big part of our existence as a country, women did not have the right to vote. And it seems, it, it seems almost unbelievable um, that that was the situation. Um, we didn't elect senators, right? For a long time, senators were chosen. Um, again, the argument about prohibition, um, you know, something that affected our, affected our country, slavery uh, for so many years. So the idea that ethical standards are static, they should never be static. And as societal ethical standards change, we hope for the better, right? Sometimes it feels like we go forward and then a step backwards and then another step forward, but we should always be progressing forward. And so hopefully as individuals, that's how we sort of view our ethical standards and we try and adapt and change as well. So with that said, then that leads to the question of the next thing generally is why do good people do bad things? And this is one of my favorite um, favorite topics because you can have a tremendous discussion on, you know, why good people do bad things or why bad people do good things, right? But here's what we're really looking for on this. So hopefully you all can see the, um, you can see my screen and if you, hopefully you can see it and you, under, you, you can tell what this is. So these are called rumble strips. Um, rumble strips, as everybody knows, are on the side of the road and they're kept, they're put there to prevent, um, you know, people from veering off the road, uh, you know, truck drivers who get, you know, who, you know, have been driving a long time potentially and get sleeping behind the wheel. They're basically there to keep us going on the path, right? So this is something that I think, um, and a lot of research, uh, you know, a lot of research has shown, a lot of studies has shown and this is what's really important. We tend to think of people as either being ethical or unethical, but a lot of times we don't really think about how they got here, right? So typically the person that got caught in the embezzlement, um, you know, within his company of millions of dollars probably didn't just live that perfectly ethical life and was honest and upright. And then all of a sudden one day, um, he just decided that he was going to embezzle $5 million, right? It, it generally just doesn't happen like that. So in life, we don't intentionally drive off the road, but we get distracted and we start drifting into a danger zone. So as part of um, presenting this, you know, especially to other people, that's a big part of this message, right? Is that you have to keep this in the forefront. And, and I know it sounds, um, I've given this, you know, webinar many times or um, uh, workshop many times, excuse me, I keep saying webinar because that's all I do lately. Um, workshop many times and, and people will say, yeah, that's obvious, but knowing it's obvious and then actually doing it um, are two different things. And if you read anything that's written or interviews from people that got into serious trouble um, for ethical violations, almost to a person, that's what they say, is that it was just that, you know, that's a cliche, but it was just that slippery slope. So, we need to keep ethical rumble strips is a cliche that um, we developed for this workshop um, to help keep us on track. And it helps keep, you know, hopefully it affects others and helps keep, helps keep them on track. So I want to just talk for a minute now specific to our profession, um, the accounting profession in general, and then also just thinking about uh, the finance profession in, in general as well, whatever um, whatever area uh, that we occupy in it. So one of the things that is quite interesting uh, to me, and I always like to propose in this, is what is the perception of the individual versus the culture or the finance profession in general? Now, if you ask people this, um, who are within the profession, right, you'll get a wide variety of answers you'll get, well, everybody hates us or everybody thinks we're great. It's incredible the wide range of answers that you get. But if you ask people outside um, the profession, you're gonna get two pretty distinct answers. If you ask people outside the profession what they think of financial professionals as individuals, they're generally gonna tell you that they think they're honest, ethical, and upright people. I hear that over and over again, right? In fact, so much so that they think that, and you know, I've heard people say, you know, oh, my next door neighbor is a CPA. He's such a smart guy and he's such an honest guy. Um, my daughter goes to his school, goes to his son's school because he told me it was great. Did you actually check out the school? No, but I, I trust him, right? Get that a lot. 
Um, you know, the number one question that people generally ask um, when they hear if you're a, in the accounting profession specifically is, you know, can you do my taxes? Even if you are not a tax person, they just assume you can. But the other thing is that they assume that you are ethical. Now you ask the same people um, who are outside the profession and outside our world, and you say, what is the perception of the, of the, what is the perception of the profession in general? And you hear a completely different story. They tell you, oh, it's very unethical, right? It's corporate greed. It's, um, you know, debacle after debacle. It's, you know, screwing the little guy. It's, you know, all these things that you hear. Now, the reality is, is it's probably neither. I mean, I like to think that we're in, I like to think that we're in as a rule and ethical profession. And yes, we've had difficulties and challenges, but we keep adapting to those and we keep trying to overcome those and, and make us and, and continue to make us better, right? And not every CPA is ethical either. So um, why this is so important though, is because if you think about ethics, we tend to think about this in how, what our ethical standards are and how we view the world, right? And sometimes it's important to really think about how others view us as well. Um, you have to have a great code of conduct and a great ethical, um, you know, ethical uh, knowledge or ethical core, so to speak. Uh, that's really important, but it's also really important to understand how other people view you. And I think it's particularly important in the profession that we're in, right? So I'd like to pose this question, you know, to our audiences, should financial professionals be held to a higher ethical standard relative to other professions? We leave that question up and you'll get some interesting answers. Um, a good majority of people will say, yes, we absolutely should. But then you will get some who say, well, no, it's important to be ethical no matter what profession you are, right? And it is, it definitely is. But I would offer this, um, that I do think, and I think most people would think that financial professionals do need to be held to a higher ethical standard. Um, so the fallout from accountants or CPAs or financial professionals being unethical, it is greater in our profession because people get really annoyed when you mess with their money. Um, and that's the, that's the best way I can, that's the best way we can to sum it up. So, um, and something that's really interesting, it, I always, um, at this point, I always ask people, you know, if you've had the opportunity, you can Google this, you can look on YouTube, you can read studies about it. It's called the one versus 10 versus $100 scenario. And there's a multitude of different names for it. But it's really interesting um, to view people and how just in general, how people view money. And it's a simple, um, it's a simple experiment to see if people can do the right thing. So the 110 versus 100, if you haven't seen it, is uh, there's a video out there and basically it's, it's a person and he'll walk by a group of people and he drops a dollar, right? And then you watch what people do around that. Virtually everybody runs to pick up the dollar and hand it to the person and say, hey, you lost this, you dropped this, right? And so very, very easy to be ethical and honest. Um, then if you do it with $10, then it's about a, you know, it's seven out of 10, let's say, right? It's most of the people will return it. Then you do it with $100, and then you really get to see the decision-making process, right? And people move a little bit slower and how many people actually return, uh, you know, return the money. So uh, the reason, again, you know, it's important to understand not only our ethical core, but how people, how other people view us, right, within a profession. But it's also really important to understand this specific behavior because that leads us into our next uh, topic is, when are you most likely to get put into an ethical dilemma? Now, this is one of these things that is super easy on the surface, but when you think about it, you really boil it down, it's super easy when you're talking about it, but it always isn't so easy in the application, right? So it's theoretical versus application. So when are you most likely to get put in an ethical dilemma? When you're in a time crunch. Uh, when your environment changes, right? Not having a full understanding or lack of expertise. This is a big one, right? So you agree to things when you didn't know the full outcome of your actions. Um, the other thing, is when there's an irrational desire to succeed or win. And so if we go back to the slide before, um, this is very obvious and this is, these are great, um, 
these are excuse me these are great things to talk about with people that are you know that are new in the working world or just getting start because it's really easy for them to get into trouble here right my boss told me to do this i'm new to the job i want to impress my boss i'm going to do it but this is where the seasoned professional really really has to think about it it's an irrational desire to succeed or win and i can give you two recent examples of this one again has to do with college athletics and i won't spend a lot of time on it but if you are not familiar with college basketball and what went on with high profile coaches and the paying of athletes and who took the fall for it and who didn't take the fall read up on it you don't have to be a basketball fan it is a fantastic discussion of ethics and ethical dilemmas and um what what really matters and what really doesn't and the outcome is quite surprising i will i will leave it at that for those of you who don't know and the other one is obviously the college enrollment scandal that we had um last year right with people thinking that um you know that their their particular child deserved to go to school because of you know a b or c it, that one was a real great one because it was per that would that discussion could take up an entire hour on what they did wrong what the in, the individual outside who's judging would have done, how the news media covered it, what the punishment should have been, um, and just in general, this, did they show any sort of attrition, right? I've talked to a lot of people about this, and everybody says, oh, it was absolutely wrong, but they tend to give the break to the person or the persons that showed sort of the contrition and you know made that public show of apology et cetera as opposed to ones who are defiant so and again this is a big thing right because let's take that for a minute let's say some of these people were good people and they did something bad and they did something unethical how the public views that is going to really shape a lot of their future moving forward and so that's a point that we always try and stress um you know to our audiences is that it it is it's so important to have that core but it's so important to really understand how others view you as well Okay, so let's talk about some things as it relates then to what we do as professionals. And I'm going to pick on the auditors for a little bit, but I always find this is an interesting, interesting exercise. So can you find things people don't want you to see? Now, the next slide I'm going to put up is, and again, if, you, if any of you have been in this presentation, you've seen this before. So how many lions do you see? That's the first thing, right? And then, oops, I didn't mean to show that. Let's go back. How many lines do you see? Now, when we're doing this workshop live at this point, I will ask the question, how many lines did you see? Those of you who haven't seen this, you can either decide, you know, was it three or less, four to six, seven to nine, um, 11 or more. And typically, the decision process that you go through in your mind was, I only saw three or four but I know we put 11 on there, so there must, there must have been some that were hidden um, that I didn't see. So that's typically what the response is, right? Now, the reality is there are tigers, but there are no lions. There are tigers, but there are no lions. And so as you're doing this workshop, um, the numbers that flash up on the screen, typically I will act like this was an accident, that I didn't mean to put the numbers up there, but actually I did that intentionally. And the, the idea is, is to lead people to believe that the challenge was about finding something, but really it's an attempt to shift your focus away from the obvious. So um, in a room full of 50 people, I will get about 10 that say that they recognize that there were, um, that there were, uh, lions versus tigers and then you'll get a group of about 30 people that will say yeah they knew what it was but they you know there's a varying there's sort of varying answers to the whole thing but the point behind this is it was an attempt to shift the focus away from the obvious so in our profession especially those of us who are um, auditors by trade or do anything else in sort of an analysis way the idea really is and it sounds cliche but the idea is to stay focused and this is a fantastic exercise again with people that are new um, that are new on the job or that are just getting acclimated to the type of work that we're doing because that's what clients do clients will come in if they have some you know our job is to you know is to to figure out what the client is doing and what they're really doing right but a lot of times they'll come in and they'll give you stuff that has nothing to do they'll give you files and documents and things that have nothing to do um with what the real focus is right and what what it, because it's they're trying to uh, they're trying to distract and trying to hide something so 
Um, lots of different exercises you can do, but this one is always, always interesting. Uh, I'm gonna pause right here, Cindy. I see a couple, um, uh, looks like a couple of questions or chats coming up. Did we have anything that we needed to answer? No, I think it just a couple people put their responses into the okay. selection of A, B, C, or D. Okay, perfect, thank you. All right, I appreciate that. And again, uh, folks, if you, you know, along the way, if you do have any comments or questions, we'll keep those coming. So let's, at this point then, let's not for the second half of this, let's get into some, uh, let's get into some case studies. And a lot of these case studies, like I said, are gonna seem fairly obvious, um, but I think that um, you'll see as we dive into those that they're, um, there's some, there's some deeper meaning behind this. So this is the first one um, that I love to do. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to ask you here at this point, since uh, if, if you do want to participate in this, so negotiation ethics, is lying acceptable? So I'm going to ask a question right now. Would you lie to a car salesman in order to get a better deal during a negotiation to buy a car? So I'm going to take a minute. If you guys want to put in your answers, I, and I, partly I do this because it's interesting to see um, what a particular group says about this. So I'll pause for just a second. So A, if you would lie, yes, or B, no. Okay, we got some yeses, we got some nos. This is always this is always interesting because a lot of a lot of how you're answering this is based on the framing of the question. So um, right now it's almost it's almost split down the middle in terms of yes or no. Okay, so here's the question then, and thank you for participating in that. So here's the question right that we're going to ask is for those who would lie to a car salesman, why do you believe this is acceptable? And for those who would not lie. To a car salesman, why not? Probably should put salesperson. Um, that was probably that's <laughs> that's a throwback, but um, we tend to think we tend to think of that in a stereo stereotypical manner as a salesman. But again, the the, the concept or the idea is: Would you lie? Why would you lie? And why would you not lie? Now, this particular discussion at this point can go a lot of different ways if you're in a group of people, right? Because a lot of people will tell you, well that's because they do it and so i'm just participating in the game um the people sometimes that say no they wouldn't do it um will get a lot of it's just you know this is this is the way i feel about it i go in i have my story this is what it is and i'm not going to alter it right and then you get some in the middle that say well no, i don't want to really lie but sometimes i kind of lead them on to think that maybe i can get a better deal somewhere else okay so we all know all the standard answers that's obvious so here's the real question it's not whether or not you would lie to the person. The question is, is there a difference between lying and bluffing? That's the question. And if you boil it down to that, and then you start the conversation from there, then it becomes a little bit more difficult to answer because you can take this and play this out. Because a lot of people will say, yeah, there's a big difference between lying and bluffing. Some people will say, no, there isn't. Right, and so then some examples become, okay, well, does anybody gamble? Does anybody go to the casino and do they play cards? Does anybody play poker, right? And then you can have that discussion and say, okay, well, that's different because that's a card game, right? Well, it's different, but it's also for money in many cases, right? So does that change whether it's okay to lie or bluff if it's real money? Um, the game of Monopoly, I hate to date myself in terms of age, but I played that as a kid. That was all about, um, that was a lot to do with bluffing, right? And you know, the basically the way that you looked at your um, your properties and things like that. So, um, in business, you know, what about trying? This is my favorite. What about trying to get the contract on a bid, right? You have a bid out, and then you know the potential client comes back, and it's between you and two other people, and he says, "Yeah, we like what you can do, but we're going to need a we're going to need A, B, and C in six months from now. Can you do it?" How many of us as business owners will say, yeah, we can do it, right? And then we hope that we hope that we can do it, right? So that's the point of this. But there's a second point, um, which is why I like to, um, which is why I like to keep this in. The idea of lying to a car salesperson has changed over the years. And this is an example where technology has really changed something in many people's eyes, at least for the better, right? Because of the internet and because of how people buy cars, um, it's 
it's a completely different experience. And I t I'd love to, to do this in front of an audience of like 20 year olds because I get so many times I get back, really? So you actually, what? Why would you go on in live July? I know exactly how much I'm financed for. And then when you explain how this was a deal back in the day and you wrote something on a piece of paper and the other person wrote back and said, no, they, they just look at you incredulously. But it's a great lesson because it's an idea or it's an example of where something, uh, technology has changed something for the good. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Um, this is called The Sheriff's Dilemma. And this centers around Todd Entrican, who was the Etowah County Sheriff in Alabama. And this case is, uh, I think goes back about three years. I think it goes back to 2016 and 2017 approximately. So here's the situation. Um, gentleman who oversaw the sheriff, Todd who oversaw the budget for the, uh, for the jail inmates, there was $750,000 left over from the budget that was there to feed the general the jail inmates. That is a fact. That is an undisputable fact. There was $750,000. Now, Sheriff Entrican used it to buy a $740,000 home. And believe me, this is how it was presented in the media and this was how it was presented to auditors and this were people who it was presented to police, etc. Okay, so the question is, is what Todd Entrican did ethical? Now, the majority of people, and you, you, can, you can answer if you want, but you know, the majority of people, when they see it framed like this, they'll say, no, what he did was not ethical. And I'm going to pause here just real quick, and, and we'll see. Okay, so is this ethical or not, right? Typically we get no. And so the answer is, well, wait, this is legal. The sheriff is allowed to take the leftover money, but if the jail food account runs out of money, he's personally liable for covering the gap, okay? So it's legal. So now this becomes what I think is a pretty obvious discussion point about um, just because it's ethical, or just because it's legal doesn't mean it's ethical, right? We've all we've all had that discussion and we've all said that, right? And then you can start to fill in the facts a little bit. Well, look, this guy also inherited $150,000 debt when he began serving, right? And he covered that. And so the law said he could take the money. So it's a real interesting discussion point just right here because you get into the situation of, okay, just because, the, you know, just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's ethical, but also wait. He had $750,000 and he went and bought $740,000 home. How does that work, right? Also, how did he get all that money? What was he feeding the inmates? Who was overseeing the process? Now, what happened was, and, and I urge you, this is a fascinating story, right? I urge you to go back and take a look at it because this story just never ends. I did this, um, the first time I did this was about a year ago, and there's been so many stories written about this since. So. He subsequently was put under a very heavy microscope of an audit, okay? And so they found, believe it or not, that he did not violate any ethical standards as, a, as it related to the ethical standards that were on the books at that time, okay? Now, he said that this, that he took and bought a $740,000 home, he did, but he said that that was not all from that money. He said his wife's finances, um, were figured into that and that he did not directly use this money to do this. So and then they did sort of an oversight on that and investigation on that. He also maintained that he inherited not a $150,000 debt, but a half a million dollar debt. And when he took over, him and his wife had to take out a loan to cover that to get things started. So he should be applauded um, for what he did. He also said that he fed he fed the inmates properly. He said they may not have liked the food, but he fed them appropriately, okay? So you get into this debate and you can go a million different ways about what's ethical, what's not ethical. But to tie it back to how important perception is, and I just, I really hit on that. I know it's obvious, but I really hit on it because it's so important in our particular profession. This guy was voted out of office because the perception was, was that he was, um, he was doing something that basically was unethical. It shouldn't have been legal. He should have known better. 
Um, and so he was voted, voted out of office, even though they found no ethical violations, right? But here's the thing, if you research this and continue to read it, it really goes far deeper than that because depending upon which version of the story you believe, which news outlet you, you read and believe, it paints two different pictures of this guy, right? One is like, well, clearly if he used the money, even if he didn't, you know, even if he used part of it, he shouldn't be buying a $300,000 home. That's, that's crazy, right? When people are just struggling to make ends meet as, the, you know, as it goes. Um, but then a lot of people will say, you know what? No way. This guy, this guy was, he was blackballed. Um, he didn't do anything wrong. You know, he took out a loan to cover. He should be, you know, and he was unfairly, unfairly convicted in the court of public opinion and his political career was basically ended of it. So the reason why, again, we spend so much time on it and why I think it's important is because on the surface, it seems obvious, but if you really talk about it and if you really research it, um, it's not so cut and dry. It, it really isn't. And I think that's the other thing too that I, is really important to get at is how the story sometimes, um, sometimes the story gets portrayed in such a bad way that um, the, the reality of it is not accurate. I, and I go back to this again, I'm probably dating myself again, but I go back to the, to the Enron and Arthur Anderson thing. It, very, pe very few people know outside of our profession, I'm not even sure how many within, um, that the verdict against Anderson was overturned in 2005. It was a small group of people and it took a whole business under, right? Um, and if you go back and you read that opinion, it's like, okay, well, maybe that wasn't the right decision. But if you bring up anyone who has any sort of knowledge of any type of scandal and you say Enron, what do they immediately think? They think Enron, then they think Anderson, and they think ethical debacle. So again, really important. Um, what do the people think of us? Now, I got a couple more, um, and then we're going to pause for some questions at the end. So this is the case of the financial analyst. This is really fascinating to do, especially... Um, in a group of people. So what we do is we have a cost benefit analysis. So typically if you're doing any kind of workshop and you break the group up into, uh, you usually break it up into you know one side versus the other. So on one side, option one is the group of financial analysts. So you own a car company and there's 11 million cars and a million and a half light trucks. You have discovered that there is a defect and the defect, while it is not noticeable, and very, very small. It's an unfortunate little defect because if you get into an accident at just the right angle, it lines up right with the gas tank and basically the car explodes. So that's the issue. Now to repair, to do a recall, it will cost you, as you can see on the graph, $137.5 million. That's option one. Option two is that you basically don't make the repairs. And this is the analysis for option two. So based on the amount of vehicles and the data that we have, which is pretty accurate, we can surmise that we're gonna have 180 people die. Um, we're gonna have 180, 180 serious burn injuries and we're gonna have 2,100 burn vehicles. And then it's the cost based on litigation lawsuits, uh, you know, the cost per vehicle, there's some scrap involved in that. It's $49.5 million, far better than option one. This is another one when you throw this out then, which do you choose um, as a CEO? Generally, everyone comes back and says option one, right? Like there's no situation in which anybody picks option two when you're giving this theoretical. But I'm sure the vast majority of you in the audience know that this was a real story and this was actually the Ford Pinto and it actually happened. And they actually chose option one and cars were exploding all over the place and it was a complete debacle for Ford. Now, here's the thing. This is where it gets really interesting. It's the theoretical and then when you find out that this is real, people are aghast, especially people who haven't been in the workforce very long, they're aghast that this actually happened. Like, how could you do this, right? Well, it's an interesting discussion because one, it's really easy. Let's say that you're the financial analyst putting forth a recommendation, right? So if I'm 25 or 26 years old, and I have just myself to think about, um, maybe the decision is easier than if I'm to my age, 53 years old, and I have a family, and I have a son that I'm putting through college, and I have a mortgage, and I have bills. What's the right decision to make, right? So let's say that the company decides that they're gonna go with option one. Do you leave and walk away, or do you be part of that? 
sort of just acquiescing in a silent manner? And that's not an easy question to answer. It sounds easy in the theoretical, but it's not in the reality because what our current situation is in life, a lot of times plays into what we do. And so again, it's a fascinating um, discussion to have because you can take it a lot of different ways. And I think just having the discussion in general with people, um, no matter where you are at life or in your work career, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating thing because there's another component to it, right? So Ford, you know, they took a hit and it was a big hit at the time, but they didn't go under. Um, Ford is still around today, last time I checked, and they went through several iterations, and there's a lot of car auto manufacturers, and gosh, you can liken this to many other, uh, many other areas as well, where, um, you know, where things have happened, and the, you know, the obvious, obvious wrong decision was made, but they still survive, and so that becomes another ethical question. Well, if I can just do it, and I can get away with it, and I know my company's going to survive, you know, you know, if I take a hit, then does that way into the ethical decision making? It shouldn't, but sometimes it does. All right, and then the last one, and we're gonna close off with this, and I think this particular presentation that we're doing right now, um, as I move forward into this, I think there's gonna be a lot of things that we're going to add to this just because of what we are dealing with now. So um, I will, I've tried to avoid giving my uh, personal opinion on anything throughout this presentation. I will say just one thing though, is that I know we've seen a lot of bad things out there. We've also seen a lot of good behavior um, by people. So that's just my, my, my own just thought, uh, you know, thoughts on the process. So I think it's great, but let's look at this one. This one happened about three or four weeks ago. And this was the guy that um, had some, we'll say some vision into what was happening. And he was a little bit pressing about it. And so he went about buying, and he ended up buying 17,700 bottles of hand sanitizer. He bought them up from everywhere. And his idea was to sell them at an inflated rate. So right on the surface, the obvious question, I don't think anybody would say, was this ethical? Everybody would say no, right? So, but what was interesting then is what happened in the process. So what happened in the process, he bought up all this hand sanitizer and then eBay and Amazon and these other outlets got wind of what he was doing and he was jacking up the price, right? He was price gouging. He was selling a $2 bottle of hand sanitizer for eight to $10 um, and they shut him down. Then came the next ethical discussion, which was, okay, the guy was clearly doing something that wasn't right. And so they shut him down. But then this guy had all of these bottles of hand sanitizer in his garage and there were people that needed it and they couldn't get a hold of it because it was just shelved there, right? And so then that became a discussion is now what should the companies do? How should they move forward like that, right? So um, it ended up, <clears throat> excuse me, it ended up, as I think everybody knows, is that he ended up, after some time donating, <laughs> doing the right thing and donating the hand sanitizer. But it was really interesting if you saw him interviewed. I don't know if anybody did, but um, he, he, he said, look, he said, I saw a business opportunity. I saw a business opportunity, and I saw the opportunity to make some money, and I thought I was going to do something nice for my spouse and my family and set us up. And he looked at it as strictly as a, just a, he was a smart business guy making a smart decision. That opens up a whole other series of debates on when is it okay to do that, right? And those of us who are involved in the stock market, we can, you know, we, we can take that down a long way and figure out what's a good stock, stock tip and what's unethical, right? So I think this is a fascinating discussion because more and more, we're going to see this in the particular, what we call the new normal um, that we live in and that we're part of. So let me pause if I can just real quick here. And um, Dawn, I loved what you said, thank you. Um, <laughs> not unethical, but morally reprehensible. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I would tend to agree that, uh, tend to agree with that. So it, it's fascinating though, the way that people think and the way that um, sometimes the lack of, community awareness, I guess I would say. Um, but when you st really start breaking it down, right, you find that these questions, um, these are questions that are not always easily answered, and he certainly didn't, didn't think so. So I'd like to wrap it up then with just a couple things. So these are takeaways, um, and I think we've all in the audience experienced these. 
Um, and these are takeaways for obviously an audience who maybe is still in school or is new to the work world. But I really think that this is important because these are easy, easy things to um, do, do the wrong thing or do something that maybe isn't such a big deal. Um, and then that's where the slippery slope starts. So the one I love is expense reports, um, mileage, mileage, uh, the, you know, the IRS pays out, I think it's 58 or 58 and a half cents per miles. And most companies pay mileage for those who travel. And that's a pretty, that's, that there's not a ton of oversight in a lot of companies on that. And it's really easy to, you know, to pop that up. Oh, I just rounded up and I drove, you know, 250 miles. It was really 220. It's not a big deal. 30 miles times, you know, 58 cents is what, 17 bucks. It's not a big deal. Um, you know, why you were late on a project. That's a big one. That's a big one that you can talk about where you, you know, do you own up to the fact that you were late on a project because you got behind and you didn't have the materials that you needed and you were, you didn't want to ask because you didn't want to look stupid or do you try and pin it on somebody else, especially in a group setting? Um, you know, you have pressure from a client to change a report or finding that's a big one. And then this is one that I think is now we're finally talking about more and more, but that's the pressure of, you know, your manager asking you to do something um, that you don't agree with morally. And that is a real interesting discussion because we are a global society. And sometimes it's really easy to put our ethical standards of what we believe, you know, especially in a business setting on to the other individual. Now, every company has its own core beliefs and its, its core ethics, right? But as a manager, sometimes we have to think about, you know, who are the people that we're supervising? How does that individual, how does, how does their view um, on life sort of, you know, how does that, you know, sort of tie in with what we're doing as a company? You know, what's my role as a manager, um, you know, to talk to this person and to find out what they think about it. If they're reacting when I, you know, they're reacting to me as something that they think I'm asking them to do is not proper when I think it is. All of those things are important discussions to have. Um, one other thing I would add is if you really want to get into this um, within a group setting or you want to do it with your staff or in other settings, uh, if you go to Harvard Law Negotiation, Harvard Law Negotiation has just some fantastic, fantastic um, case studies and they're role-playing um, they're role-playing workshops and they're very economical um, to purchase from them. We do that through our uh, student organization, Beta Alpha Psi, and they're, they're just great because they really make people think about, you know, what I think is moral and what I think is ethical and how I would negotiate something. What's, you know, how does that plan in terms of like me and me getting my job done and me getting my, my boss, what he wants, and then dealing with somebody on the other side and what, you know, what their role is, how they're thinking about it. How do we meet in the middle? It's, it's just fascinating. So at this point, um, I just want to thank everybody. Um, I, there are a few, a few takeaways I think that are pretty obvious is that your beliefs can, and they should evolve over time. They should evolve in a progressive manner and to determine who's who you know to determine what that manner is you know that's up to the individual but more and more you should um you should have that conversation but you really should periodically assess yourself and your ethical standard i think that is something i just think that that's something that's really important and you know again like we said at the beginning the studies show that those those who periodically assess it and are thinking about it they're much more likely to do um to do the right thing and then you know as part of the workshop it's always good to leave this is that you know you need to assess the people that are around you and their ethical standards for you if they're not good for you then limit the involvement in your life and that sounds like i love that when my my friend christine wrote this into that i said geez you sound like my parent <laughs> and she goes and she goes well she goes i'm 60 years old so i can say it but it is a really good guideline right and i tell that to my son um i tell that to my coworkers, and i have my coworkers constantly talking about and telling me the same things as well so um three good things uh to take away and again hopefully um as part of this workshop hopefully there was um, some things that made you all think and gave you something not just so much to test yourself also but really to take away and take back to your um you know to your places of work and hopefully make that as also part of your ethical curriculum so uh, I would like to pause at this moment and say thank you, and I will open it up uh, if there's any questions. And Cindy, if you have any final comments. 
Yeah, thank you, Paul. And if any of you do have any questions, if you want to, if you can raise your hand, um, we can actually open up the mic so you can actually ask a question. Mm -hmm. We've got about five minutes. So if there's anybody that has a question, you know, raise your hand and we can go from there. Otherwise, you can also write your questions in the question and answer area. And I just really want to thank you, Paul, so much for doing this program for us. It's, I just love it. And I think it's, it's a great program. And I know everybody, you know, picked up a few pointers as well. So. And I will just say, I, I appreciate again, being invited um, to do this. And it's, uh, it, it is, it, it, it's a challenge to do it virtually, but I just appreciate everybody staying on and, and participating because it's, you know, it's, it's more fun sometimes when you can walk around a room and hear what people have to say, but, you know, we have to adapt these things. And so um, to that extent, I think that it's, um, I think that, you know, ho hopefully, like I said, hopefully you got something out of it and you can take that and maybe, maybe make it better and take it to your group and, and continue the conversation. Great. So does anybody have any questions? Give everybody just a minute. There is there is a way to raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Now everybody's going to be quiet, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> that's that that's usually what happens and then I get emails afterwards. So that's that's not a problem. That that's not a problem. All there right. We, there we have it looks like we have somebody. Oh, that's a great question. Thank you, Bridget. Um, COVID-19 will likely have various nudge effects. How do you think ethics and how companies operate will change? Okay, so just give me just like 60 seconds on this because we're already seeing it um, in the retail world. So I, I, you know, I get all sorts of advertisements, right? For like, cause I buy on Amazon and I buy different much things on retails. And, and this is, I've had this discussion with our leadership at our company just this week about this. So here's what's interesting in the retail world, why people are trying to sell something, what happened the first three weeks, the first three weeks, like I could not open up my email without somebody telling me, you know, how difficult it was and how much they cared about me and what they were doing from touchless pizza to taking care of their workers to whatever it was, right? And so if you've noticed, we've kind of hit a threshold for that. And now people are trying to figure out what's the message they can say, because we're in this sort of middle period, right? We're, we're not sure how long this is going to last. Is it going to last another month? Is it going to last three months? What's the political fall, the political fall, but the economic fall are going to be? And so you're starting to see the switch. So now I'm getting emails from my champion sports, right? I got four emails from them saying what they were doing for their employees. I'm not getting any of that. Now I'm getting an email that says, hey, got to go to that Zoom meeting. Hey, you got to go to that online class. Want to be comfortable from the waist down? You should buy our sweats. And so people are already adapting to sort of what they're considering, at least the new norm or the interim norm. And then you're going to find companies are going to have to define what is ethical and what is not ethical. Now, I think that there's going to be some pushback when, it is, when the perception is that it's not ethical. And I think there's going to be a heightened awareness um, there certainly is right now as it relates to what you can sell a product for, what's in this necessary business. I, but that heightened awareness is going to subside. It always does. We adapt. Humans adapt very quickly. Businesses adapt. And so as some businesses fade away and new businesses cr are created, it's, you know, there, it's just, it's going to have to be up to the people and we're going to have to watch it and, and try and figure it out because there is going to be a temptation to sort of get an advantage on people. So anyway, hopefully that, that was kind of a long winded answer, but hopefully that answered it because we're already seeing the shift in advertising and we're going to see, you know, that shift is going to be playing out as it relates to the ethical behavior. So that was a good question to end on. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Paul, so much. I really appreciate you joining us and, uh, I can't thank you enough for, you know, being a partner with AFWA. We greatly appreciate that partnership. And, um, you know, some of you have had a chance to check out the Surgeon's website. I do recommend that you do it. They've got some great programs and 
we've got some partnership items we're working on together. So we're very going to be very excited about um, getting those up and running here shortly that you'll find as a benefit to membership. And I just really want to thank you all for being a member of AFWA. You know, our role as an organization is so important in today's society and and with everything that's going on, we just really want to wish you all the very best and stay healthy and stay safe. So thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.